Skellig Rocks are one of Ireland's most striking island outposts. Some 12 kilometres off County Kerry, the larger of the two, Skellig Michael, is a World Heritage Site and home to a remarkable early Christian monastery on the lower of the island's two peaks. The islands are also renowned for their bird life. Little Skellig is one of the largest gannet colonies on Earth, home in summer to some 50,000 breeding birds. And many other kinds of seabirds use the Skelligs for breeding and rest stops. Come summer on Skellig Michael, the most striking avian visitors are the puffins. Thousands arrive out of the Atlantic Ocean in April and use the rock as their base for the spring and summer months. After a winter on the Atlantic, new arrivals are greeted with bill tapping and other gestures of welcome. When the puffins arrive, they move into burrows on the island, clean them out and prepare for the breeding season ahead. Puffins lay just one egg in their burrows, and it's a long process to get the chick to independence. So for between three and four months, the parents must mind their offspring and guard the burrow. Most days one or both parents head off during the day to fish at sea. Dusk sees them returning to the rock in their thousands. Puffins bring a unique character to Skellig in summer. One of the great mysteries about puffins is where they go in autumn and winter. For come August, one evening, Skellig will be alive with thousands of puffins. The next day, they'll be all gone, leaving a void behind them. Scientists have long puzzled about this coordinated departure and where the birds go for the next eight months. University College Cork have been studying Ireland's puffins for years and have come to Skelly to try and find answers to some of the mysteries around the puffins' remarkable lives and ocean journeys. We'll set up a station here. Ring, geolocator, weigh, measure, take a feather sample and gone and release it back. And again, we're only after the breeders, so look for birds that are coming back with fish. And there'll be ones that are sort of definitely coming in and bombing into a, a burrow. We're specifically looking for breeding seabirds. These are birds that are currently raising a chick, but we're very interested in how these animals after breeding season spend their time. So they're the most important part of the population. They're the ones that are gonna renew for the next generation and the next generation. So we're really interested in knowing what pressures they're facing out at sea. We're fitting them with one of these small tracking devices. It's called a geolocator. The geolocator here has essentially got a, a very small light sensor between two little saltwater switch probes. It records the time and the light levels, and we can use the light level readings to get a rough estimate of where they are in the world. So they go on at the end of the breeding season, they stay on over the winter, and then we collect them back off the animals next year, and that'll tell us where they've traveled to over the entire winter period. The 
we tagged puffins in 2010 and again in 2012 and found that the Irish puffins are actually traveling right the way across to Canada to coincide with the timing of a, a capelin run. So it's a very small oily fish that's very nutritious pick up all of that stuff while it's available for a couple of weeks and then they spend the rest of their winter in the middle of the Atlantic, southeast of the tip of Greenland. So not a very hospitable place to spend the winter. And then they arrive back here at the start of the, the breeding season, around about February, March, April, to start it all again. So they're making an extraordinary journey for a bird that is quite inefficient at flight. Four hundred exactly. We put the tag on the bird, but we take the bird's weight in a bag just to get an idea of how healthy they are. We can also look at their bill and you can kind of count the grooves in the bill of the, the puffins to get a rough age of them as well. So they tend to sort of get an extra groove each year up until around about age four and then you can't tell how old they are. So you know it's at least four years old. Norwegians say that apparently in the northern areas they're a lot bigger and they're a lot more vicious. Like every single one of them absolutely says it's the most vicious seabird they've ever worked on. They are quite feisty, right? Yeah. So, I mean, just look at the size of it. How much damage can it do? So when you look at a puffin, you can't really tell whether it's a male or a female. There are some small behavioural cues, but to be 100% certain, we just take a, a little feather sample and you get a little bit of genetic material that run that in a lab, work out the sex of the birds. And we put a little identification metal band around their leg and it's a unique identifying number and we've actually seen some of those birds here that we would have tagged way back in 2010 so 10 years later and they're still here breeding so they're quite remarkable little birds we're really sort of doing this from a conservation angle some of the early data that we've been collecting from this from back in 2010 to 2013 has been going into a very large data set of seabird tracking from a range of different species and that's identified an area in the central mid-Atlantic that's a, a hot spot for overwintering seabirds and there's currently a proposal to make this a high seas marine protected area to conserve seabird species so the data we're collecting here on this island is feeding directly into that process for international um, protected areas for seabirds. We've actually been privileged enough to get permission from the OPW. Um, they've actually been incredibly supportive of the science that we're doing out here. There are very important populations of seabirds on this island. The OPW have been fantastic at facilitating that research for us. It's, it's a beautiful place when it's all to yourself. I'm incredibly privileged actually to, to be out here on a day like this as well. <laughs> 